Is space tourism going to become a thing? Will we get people back to the moon and beyond to Mars? What's even going on and how do we get people engaged? We're going to have part three, I guess, of a conversation we've been having with Ellie in space. Uh, let's just do that. I'm Brian. Welcome to Futuraza. Oh, 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 oh. So you've built a lot of um, engagement in the community among uh, like you said, space uh, super fans. Uh, how do you see the role of social media and content creators in, you know, fostering the the interest in space exploration generally? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. My demographic is like 92% male, age 50 and up, right? And so most of the people watching my channel are older men. I'm wondering how to get that younger audience interested. So, you know, I do post to Instagram and I have somewhat of a following there, but I think, you know, if you look at Tim Dodd's channel, for example, or you might know him as Everyday Astronaut, I think he has close to 2 million subscribers. So that tells me that there is a lot of interest in space and I certainly haven't tapped into even half of what my, you know, potential audience could be. Um, but I think that what I am struggling to do is to bring in younger people to my channel. And so that's something that I, I don't have an answer for. But what I do like to do and what I'm told from people is like bringing space or telling the mainstream public why they should even care. Why should I care about what's going on on this beach in South Texas, right? Well, because this is going to affect everyone around the world, you know, once they get it going and we can have eventually, hopefully someday that point to point transfer, all sorts of stuff. So that's kind of, you know, what, what my goal is, but certainly I'm still learning as I go. You know, uh, I don't know if you remember, but when we were both at the shareholder 23 meeting, you, me and Joe Tegmeyer and maybe one other person were looking at our viewer demographics together and we're like, oh, those are the same people. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. because my audience does skew 97% ish male and uh, might be 96. The lowest I've ever seen is 96 and, and overwhelmingly 55 and up. Uh, so, <laughs> and the only person I've seen who draws in a younger crowd was uh, bearded Tesla guy because he does a lot of overlanding and off-road adventures. And there's yeah. uh some fun to be had there. The yep. short form content, sorry, the short form content is I think where you're really gonna grab the young eyes. And that's like, that's a whole different conversation of, do we want this fragmented attention span, you know, sort of feeding the machine? Obviously there's not a lot of revenue involved in that. So it's a different story, but I think that's where a lot of young people are. They're on the shorts. They're on the shorts. They are. So you mentioned the beach. Uh, I guess that's a good segue into the environmental situation, which is how do we balance protecting the environment with the critical importance of space exploration? Because when you, nothing can be done with zero harm. That's not, right. you can't do anything. Uh, you want to minimize harm, but but how do you, wh what's the appropriate balance to strike? Well, trust that they have agencies like the FAA and Fish and Wildlife watching SpaceX like a hawk. SpaceX has done a lot in the area, not only, you know, reinvesting in Cameron County and the schools, but also to improve the environment. There's video of them helping rescue sea turtles. I mean, they do a lot to kind of balance that, you know, dilemma of we don't want to do too much harm. And so I feel like that's part of the story that's not told as much. In fact, it may be a good idea next time I go down there to sort of scope out exactly what they're doing. But we've seen many um, articles SpaceX has shared before some of the work that they're doing um, that they're they're monitored pretty closely uh, for those reasons. And so I do think that they have you know, a genuine interest in protecting the environment. And they're not just like the big bad wolf that that doesn't care. Well, and it's crazy because I appreciate all the environmental activism. I appreciate environmental protection. But when I see a blatant lie, it yeah. really makes it easy for me to see why someone would discard everything yeah. you have to say. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like the concerns about um, 
when we saw the amount of water that they would need to be permitted to discharge from the deluge system. Yes. They were saying, oh, my gosh, if you were to discharge that much every single day, do you understand how much damage it would cost? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Every single day? What do you – you couldn't fill it in a day. <laughs> Guys, that's – and also, do you know how much uh, – fresh water falls over that area of land when there's a modest rain right less less than that ah. so yeah we're trying to do big things and we want to do them well let's talk big do you see there being habitats on other celestial bodies the moon mars is it going to happen oh without a doubt I think for sure. And I think the, st the stepping stone of the moon is, you know, a lot of people say, why don't we just go to Mars now? Or <laughs> some people say, why don't we not go to either and focus on our problems here on earth? It's like, do you know how many problems we've been able to fix or like make better on earth because of things we've learned from going to space? But I digress. I think that going to the moon, you know, is, is essential. It's paramount. It's a great stepping stone you know, because it's not as far away and as bold and brazen as going to Mars. But I do believe it will happen. And I think that we absolutely should have a permanent presence on the moon. I mean, it's great what we did with the Apollo missions, but we don't need another flags and footprints mission. You know, we, we should be having people living there, working there, all volunteer. <laughs> Uh, the only the only thing that, you know, is interesting to think about is when you look at the moon now, it's just blank. And how will that change in 50 years when we look up there? It's not going to be the same moon that you and I have lived with our whole lives. That's another thing. It's like it's weird to, like, realize these things in real time. You know, Starbase is going to change. Starbase might not be accessible in the future. That's like you know, kind of, kind of scary, right? Because it's so important to all of us, particularly the people who have quit their jobs, dropped everything to move there and start a business um, around what's going on at Starbase. But I think it's the same thing with the moon. I think that things will change, particularly as, you know, I mean, look at how quickly the commercial space industry is developing. So without a doubt, yes, we will have, you know, habitats on, on somewhere other than Earth. It doesn't appear to be a physics problem. It appears to be an engineering problem, and there are engineers working on it. A lot of these solutions are known. They're just expensive and dangerous, and we're working to make that better. And when you said, you made a great point. You said, oh, how come, how come we can't address problems right here on Earth? Why are we wasting money in the sky? And you're right. These steps toward that mission benefit everyone on Earth. Starlink only exists because Elon wanted to put a greenhouse on Mars and the so yeah. the Russians would not let him do it at yep. any at without I mean they were they were not being reasonable, I guess is what I would say there. They were spitting on a shoe. And yeah. so it's like, okay, I guess I'll just do it by myself. <laughs> And, yeah. and get a team of engineers that are at jobs where they have stability and it's not some crazy idea. And thank goodness they took that leap of faith. Plus, they're all super rich now. So I'm sure they're happy that they did. But yeah, it's interesting, you know, this idea of when things fall apart, it's for better things to fall together and just the grit and determination. I hope that the SpaceX story, even if you don't care about space, Use the inspiration in your own life. It is such an inspiring story. It's incredible. When you're having a bad day, I don't know about you, but what I like to do is go back and watch the Falcon Heavy test launch with yes. the double landing. It's a short video. It's got some David Bowie. It just, oh, man, is it magical. Gives you goosebumps. And sometimes I'll also watch the first successful Starship touchdown because that's just, it's insane. Yeah. It's insane. It's its too crazy, Ellie. It can't be done. You are um, a journalist in a field that is mostly male. How do you see the role of female journalists and female astronauts and engineers? And what can we do to support that? Yeah. Um, how do I see the role? Well, I... I, I am curious to see when more uh, female space creators come on the scene. I think it's only a matter of time. Um, but 
I actually think I've used it to my benefit because I'm like one of the channels that stands out because I am, you know, a blonde girl covering space news. You don't see that a lot. So I actually kind of have liked that I'm in the minority there. But I do, uh, I do think that, you know, for example, on Instagram, there's a group of women of female engineers and they, they all have quite, quite good following. So I think that there is a lot of support. I think, you know, times have really changed. And um, I guess I don't see a lot of like inequality on my end. Now, whether you're a female engineer, I don't know that side of the story, but as a creator, I think it's pretty equal opportunity. Um, and, you know, in many ways, like I said, I'm glad there's not a lot of female space creators. Well, I will say from lo the outside looking in at the engineering, we've got, I would say aerospace historically has been a good old boys club. Yes. And then Gwen Shotwell comes along and knocks it out of the park. Yeah. And if you look at a lot of the uh, engineers, a lot of the longest standing employees at SpaceX, uh, their backgrounds are very diverse. Mm -hmm. um, both in terms of uh, uh, gender and uh, ethnic background. And you right. know, so all of that, <clears throat> it's uh, it's getting it's getting better, I guess I would say. Yeah. So, so the last one, and this is a tough one, is misinformation, because well, inf misinformation spreads very quickly. It's very easy to get bad information out. And uh, what is your advice uh, to give to viewers? Uh, who may not have enough experience in with space news to know what to look for to spot um, to spot misinformation and recognize credibility. Hmm, it's tough, well, right? I would say that the channels that are pretty large are large for a good reason. They've earned that following. They've proven themselves to be reliable and. Um, I don't know what I would also say to that is there's still a large group of people that don't think we ever landed on the moon. So, <laughs> I mean, seriously, I see a lot of that every day. And so it's like, uh, I don't know. I think some people will believe what they want to believe. I like what X is doing with community notes. I think that that's important. It might be good to have YouTube do a similar thing. But that's a tough question. Uh, I mean, I guess you could just say they should just watch my channel because, you know, I'm a journalist by trade, but no. There we go. That's the answer. That's it. <laughs> uh, I would say we, uh, why don't we throw in Tim Dodd and Marcus House and Scott Manley as well. And yes. that's a good round group of, um, of people from around the world right. and uh, of varying backgrounds and uh, all people that I find very credible and, um, and helpful. Uh, because the future is uh, going to be on Earth, surely, but also elsewhere. So let's make it happen. Let's get excited and let's be supportive. Uh, guys, could you do me a favor? Could you head on over to uh, Elliot Space? Check it out. I'm sure you already have, but check it out again. And and uh, make sure you're still subscribed because YouTube loves to unsubscribe people. Uh, and you can follow her on X on YouTube. Uh, and what are your other socials? I should list those as well. Instagram is Eliana in space because Eliana is my actual first name and the other handle was taken. Um, and uh, that's that's about it. Eliana. See, I thought L.E. stood for low earth. Never mind. It's fine. <laughs> so, guys, what did we miss? What did we misunderstand? Leave it into them in the comments below and stay tuned. Stay juicy. And I cannot wait to hear from you clever robots in space.